I'm John Carter in Moscow, in Havana, Cuba. Now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, right here in communist China, reporting from India. Hi, I'm John Carter in the Solomon Islands. I'm John Carter in Soweto, from El Salvador. I'm John Carter in Sydney, Australia. In this message, John Carter explains why there is hope for the worst of sinners. Uh, welcome back. We're talking today about hope for the very worst of sinners. We're talking about the fact that the grace of God is greater than all of our sins. When I was a kid, I was taught the song, and it just stays in my mind. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Love for us all. Oh, how can it be? In the first part of our program, we talked about Ahab, probably the most wicked man in all the Bible. But the Bible tells us that Ahab found grace. And if he found grace, then he found forgiveness and mercy. One of my favorite characters in history, and I guess one of the most favorite characters of all people in the Western world is Winston Churchill. When England was being bombed by the Nazis, by the Germans, Churchill made a tremendous speech. And standing before the House of Commons, he said, with his lips stuck out, he said, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Now, I want to use those words in a different way today. We're not fighting the Nazis or the Germans, but we are fighting the devil. And I want you to know this. Never give up. Never give up on yourself. Never come to the place where you think, I'm going to be lost because nobody cares about me, because God hasn't given up on you. And you may have a loved one, you may have a son or a daughter, a member of the family, and that person seems to be going down, 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 down. I want to say to you, never give up, because the grace of God is greater than all of our sins. There is hope for the very worst of sinners. If God could save Ahab, he can save you and me. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 15 and verse 1 and 2. I want you to turn to it sitting here in the studio, the great audience out there. I want you to follow along with me. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near, uh, near to him, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives uh, sinners and uh, eats with them. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, Well, for the first time, guys, in your lives, you're right. <laughs> because I do receive sinners and I do go to eat with them. The gospel, my friend, is not for innocent, sinless people. The gospel is for sinners. And the Bible says this man receives sinners. Then in this chapter, Jesus gives three stories. I'm not going to go through it right now. He tells the story of the lost sheep. It's one of a hundred and it wanders away and uh, the father, the, the shepherd, leaves the security of home and he goes and he finds the lost sheep. And when he finds it, he doesn't kick it, but he kisses it. That's how God treats sinners. Then there's the story of the lost coin, the coin that is lost in the very house of God. People are lost in the church. And the woman who symbolizes the church goes looking for the coin. And when she finds the coin, she says, thank God, hallelujah, I found the lost coin. That's how God treats sinners. Young people in the church who may be despised because they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing, but they are coins to be saved for the treasury of the kingdom. And then there is a third story. It, it is the parable of the lost boy. And the boy who goes away from home, he's this ungrateful fellow. He says to his father, give me what belongs to me. He can't wait until his father's dead. But he says, give me my share of the inheritance. And the Bible tells us he goes off and he wastes his, funny, his father's money 
in riotous living, his elder brother said he wasted his money with the harlots. But the Bible tells us here is a bad boy. Don't be too soft on this boy. He's a bad boy. But this boy, the Bible tells me, he comes to himself. And when he comes to himself and he goes to the father's house, the father runs out, this old man runs out and throws his arms around him and hugs him and kisses him and puts a ring on his finger. Oh, he puts a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and a robe to cover the filth. It's amazing. This man receives sinners. So the Bible teaches that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And you may feel completely unworthy. I want you to know this. This man receives sinners. I want to tell you a few stories. You know about Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4 is a story. He's proud, uh, he's arrogant, uh, he is uh, the supreme egotist. Uh, he deserves to go to hell, but Christ saves him. I believe from Scripture that King Nebuchadnezzar, the potentate of the great Babylonian empire, is going to be in the kingdom of God with Ahab. People say it's not right. No, no, it's called grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sins. Then you know the story of David and Bathsheba. Not only does he commit adultery with this seductive, beautiful woman uh, who is the wife of Uriah the Hittite, but he lies about it uh, and he murders Uriah, does he deserve to go to heaven? David deserves to go to hell. But in scripture, you read the amazing story that David repents. It's told in Psalm 51. People say, I can't, I can't believe that he could go to heaven. And Jesus is called the son of David, through David and Bathsheba. Amazing. Then there's Peter. You know about Peter, who denied that he knew Jesus. What a terrible sin. When Jesus needed a buddy, when Jesus needed a friend, when Jesus needed somebody to stand beside him, Peter said when Jesus was standing alone and feeling terribly alone, when the Son of Man, he was the Son of Man, not only the Son of God, he had a heart that felt pain. And when he's standing alone, Peter says, I don't know him. But later on, Jesus sent a message. He said, tell my disciples and Peter. Peter was redeemed. Peter was saved. Peter will be in the kingdom. Then there was Paul, St. Paul we call him. But he didn't start out as St. Paul. Paul was the great Pharisee who was the persecutor of the saints and whose garments were sprinkled with the blood of Stephen. Can you think about this? Has anybody here had his garments sprinkled with the blood of one of the great saints of God? And then he went to Damascus to arrest the Christians and drag them back to Jerusalem. But he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he repented and he was saved. When I was running a campaign in the great city of uh, Kiev in Ukraine, a, a man came after this great baptism we had one day and he was a full-ranking colonel, and we had baptized him that very morning in the Dnieper River. And he told me the story that he was in charge of the indoctrination of all the soldiers in that part of the world into atheism. He taught them there is no God. Yet he was baptized because he came as a penitent to Christ. That is why I believe that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. It is not so much 
the sin question as it is the Son question. And if you and I will believe in the Son, we will not perish, but we will have everlasting life. Therefore, as Churchill said, never, never, never give up on any person, especially yourself. In Russia, I've been privileged to see things that very few people have seen. When I tell them these stories, they can't believe these stories because they know so little of the power of God. There was Ildar, the Russian mafia man. He had an army of 400 soldiers with machine guns. He told me how he personally would fill people's bellies uh, with lumps of lead, fill it up with guns. He said, I knew how to shoot them so they would live. He said, I filled up one man's belly with five bullets and the man said, you're killing me. He said, no, if I was killing you, I wouldn't be shooting you there. I'd be shooting you in the head. But this man, by the grace of God, and I give glory to God, this man received our videos of a full evangelistic series. This is why I believe in evangelism. People who don't believe in evangelism do not believe in the power of God because I've never seen it. It doesn't operate in their own lives. They're playing a game which is called church. But they know nothing of the grace of God. Hilda received our videos and after watching the first one, he was immediately converted. He said it's impossible. Impossible for man, but not impossible for God. He went out and shared his message with his team of Russian mafia soldiers and they gave their lives to Christ and they built a temple for the glory of God, which I've been in. I know it's true. There was Vasily, his lieutenant. These are some of my mafia guys. <laughs> if you look at you, we've got these camouflage, but if you looked at Vasily's face, there's a scar that runs from here right down to here where a bullet passed through his eye and came out here. These men now have become real preachers of the gospel and yet they were murderers. Why? Because of grace. That is greater than all of our sins. Sergei, one of three gangsters who came to our meetings in this in Novgorod. Three came and they're all threatened by the mafia. We're going to murder you unless you give up this faith. They said, at least Sergei said, then shoot me because I cannot give it up. The other two whom we had baptized gave up the faith. Not all stand for Christ. When it gets hot, many people give up the faith. But Sergei said, never, never, never. And the mafia was so impressed with the, with the faith of this man, with his passion and his devotion that they said, and then if God has forgiven you, then so will we. So they forgave him for the sin of leaving the mafia. You've all heard, I'm sure, of Kari Ten Boon. That Dutch lady, they had a jewelry shop and a house and they took in Jews and they hid the Jews in secret compartments and they were betrayed by a neighbor. How despicable to betray your own country but to betray God's people and to betray refugees. How satanic. So Kari, young Kari, old Kari, sent to a concentration camp. Her father died, of course, beaten to death by the Nazis. These evil people, these evil racists, these God deniers, that were made up of all the religions of Germany. No. These folks, folks were atheists. No. They were anti-Christians, but they belonged to all of the church, the Lutheran church, the Catholic church, the Baptist church. All the churches said, Sieg Heil. 
You know why? Because they had never, never known Christ. They followed the church. They didn't follow God. What about you? After Corrie got out miraculously from the concentration camp, her sister died, starved to death, beaten by death. Her father died. She was let out by a mistake. She was giving a meeting somewhere in Holland. And she spoke about how she had decided to forgive the German Nazis and her Dutch neighbours who had betrayed her. You say, oh, that's not hard to do. No, because you never had to do it. If you can't forgive people, don't expect to be saved. If you can't forgive your enemies, don't expect to be saved, Jesus said. And one night after she had the meeting, a big German came down the front and said, Curry, do you remember me? She said, no. Yes, you were my jailer. The man who had been responsible for the death of his sister. He said, how about a hug? How about a hug? He said, Curry, can you forgive me? And she did. That is called grace. How you, how you treat your enemies or people who hurt you shows whether you are in the grace of God or not. But if God could forgive Ahab, I imagine he could forgive her jailer. There are conditions of salvation. Today, I'm not talking about cheap grace. I'm talking about free grace, but not cheap grace. And notice this, so you don't go out from this meeting under some cloud of darkness and misunderstanding. Number one, I must believe in God. This grace is for those who believe and believe with their hearts and their minds. Number two, it is for those who trust in Christ. To trust in Christ means that I will not trust in my good works. I will not trust in my own merits. I will trust in the merits of Christ because I have no merits of my own. Number three, now it gets difficult. I will acknowledge my sins. I will acknowledge my sins and this will lead to repentance whereby I will say after I acknowledge my sins, number four, the next point, I will repent. And repentance should not be forced upon anybody. Repentance is the gift of God and it comes because in our hearts we are contrite and we are sorry for our sins. And there is no mercy and no forgiveness without repentance and that is why Ahab clothed himself in sackcloth, which is the symbol of repentance. The people who find it the hardest to repent are people who go to church. Because generally speaking, they are the most self-righteous. And remember, the people who put Christ on the cross were the religious people. I don't believe that, you say. Well, obviously, you haven't read the scriptures. Repentance is saying, I'm sorry. And number five, it gets even more difficult. The Bible says you should make restitution. People say, no, no, no. Well, let me turn it around. If somebody stole $10,000 from you, would you want it back? You'd say, yes, if the person is sincere, he'll pay it back. Of course. Sincere repentance is followed by sincere Restitution, like the man in Tyree, a little town in North New South Wales in Australia, whom I baptized, who before the baptism used to go down to where the train stopped at the bottom of his paddock and steal the tops or the tarpaulins from the railway. He said, what am I going to do? I said, it's very simple. You've got to return them. 
Many folks would say, no, I would never return them. Then if you cannot return them, you have not repented and you cannot be saved. This is the clear teaching of the Bible. And number six, to be saved, I must accept salvation. It is a gift. We are not talking about cheap grace that is preached in, in so many pulpits here in America and around the world. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know him? He was one of the great Germans of the Second World War and he stood out against Hitler and received, uh, refused to give the Sieg Heil or follow him. Bonhoeffer was a pastor and a theologian. One of a tiny minority, the British gave him sanctuary in London. But when the persecutions became intense, he said, I must return to Germany and be with my people. He was a Lutheran. He wrote this, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Get that? Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Because he had true grace in the end, they came for him and he was hung up, put to death by the Nazis. We're not talking counterfeit Christianity, not cheap grace, but costly grace. Grace that reaches down from the cross of Christ and redeems. It is grace that forgives. It is grace that transforms. I'm now back in Brisbane and the choir is singing the mission choir. Sinners, Jesus will receive. Sound this word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway leave. All who linger, all who fall. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receiveth sinful men. Anybody who will come and repent and believe. So come now, there is hope for the worst sinner. There's hope for you and there's hope for you and there's hope for me. But I must feel my need. Some years ago, as you folks, some of you know, we're going to Manila for a big citywide campaign. I don't like to use the term crusade because of its connotations in the dark ages. In Australia, we never called it an effort. What a terrible word that is. I'm going to have an effort. Talk about, I mean, that's odious. We called it a mission. So we're going to have a mission to Manila. And when I went there many, many years ago, when I was a young man and I had some fire in my preaching and I had some energy, I was taken into this high security jail and I preached a sermon, my first one I've ever preached on death row. These young men, men were going to be executed in the electric chair. You know what I preached on? Christ in the electric chair. Christ on the cross, Christ on the gallows. And as I made an appeal, they, they broke down, they cried, they came, stood around, held on to the bars. Then Dr. Graham Bradford, my old buddy, and I took them into an adjoining room and there was a tank of water and we took these young men, these young convicts down into the water and we baptized them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit on death row. So if Jesus can save murderers and adulterers and fornicators, somebody said he can even change, he can even save self-righteous church members. They're the hardest to save. I've been a pastor for more than 50 years. I know what I'm talking about. Nobody is too hard for Jesus. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Sing it again, I say to the choir. At five years of age, sinners Jesus will receive. Even me, 
with all my sin. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. See my servant, see Ahab? He's in sackcloth. Therefore I will not do to him what I said I was going to do. My message to you is this. Whoever you are, whatever you have done, my friend, are you listening to me? Whoever you are, whatever you have done, there is mercy and forgiveness and heaven for you because where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And we say, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter. Behind me is the great city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Did you know, this is quite amazing, there are more people living in this area than in New York City, and Christ died for these people. We came here, oh, a long time ago, back in 1984. What's that, 34, 35 years ago? And we came here with a team of young people, and we came to the PICC. It is our intent to come here, hire the biggest hall that's available, the greatest outdoor stadium, whatever it takes. You've got more than 20 million souls out here. And I say it again, these are people for whom Christ died. I'm asking you to pray for the people of the Philippines. Please pray for the people here in Metro Manila. And please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. In Australia, write to me at Terrigal at the address that is now showing on the screen. We're back in Manila, and we're back with a message from God. That message is, Christ died for you, and Christ is coming again soon. Please support us. Write to me today, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, and also write to me at Terrigal in Australia. Thank you for your support, and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.